Let us pray. Out of your word and into our hearts, may your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. For 17 years, Tony Dungy dreamed of a head coaching position in the NFL. As an assistant coach, he'd built a solid reputation. He received four interviews for head coaching positions in 10 years, but the talks didn't go well. Part of the reason for this was his coaching philosophy. Dungy said that the key to winning championships was changing players' habits. Instead of having to make hundreds of decisions during a game, he wanted his players to respond in the moment without even having to think about what they were doing. This would cause the other team to have to react. Coach Dungy taught that habits are a three-step loop. There's the cue, followed by the routine, and then the reward. And he said that by focusing on the routine, that you could actually change someone's habit. Charles Duhigg, in the book The Power of Habit, said Dungy's strategy embodied the most powerful tool for creating change, what is known as the golden, the golden rule of habit change. To change a habit... You keep the old cue, and you keep the old reward, but you insert a new routine. Four times Dungy interviewed with his habit-based coaching philosophy. Four times he didn't get the job. But then in 1996, the desperate Tampa Bay Buccaneers called, and they interviewed Dungy, and he got the job. And the rest is history. For seven seasons with the Bucks and another six seasons with the Indianapolis Colts, Dungy only missed postseason appearances twice. He led the Colts to a title in Super Bowl 41, making him the first head coach who is also black to win a Super Bowl. His habit-based philosophy is widely used in football, as well as in every other sport, all evidence that his coaching philosophy works. We can use a similar philosophy to help us make lasting changes in our lives. In the book, Atomic Habits, by James Clear, that many of us are reading together, Clear offers the habit loop to visualize a process for change. The habit loop is a feedback loop. A cue triggers a craving, motivating a response leading to a reward, satisfying the craving, and ultimately becoming associated with the cue. As we associate cues with specific rewards, a subconscious craving emerges in our brain that starts the habit loop spinning. The craving is what powers the habit loop. Most of the time, the craving emerges so gradually, we're not aware that it even exists. So we're blinded to its influence. Let me give you an example. Occasionally, I'll eat at 306 Barbecue. I like barbecue. And 306 is just across the street from the church. Some days when I'm leaving the church, if the wind is blowing just right, I get the smell of barbecue. Now, if I'm able to maintain my self-discipline, or at least if I'm in such a hurry to get to another appointment that I don't have time, I'm able to resist the craving that is prompted by the cue of the smell of barbecue, or otherwise I would find myself just heading straight over there to get the reward of the barbecue. Adapting our response to the cue and ultimately redirecting the craving is the key to changing our habits. Jesus, in thinking about how our lives are changed, wanted us to understand the cost of following through. In Luke 14 that Emily read for us just a moment ago, large crowds are following Jesus. Some people are just curious about this teacher from Nazareth, while others are more interested in becoming one of his disciples, one of his followers. Jesus, though, is on his way to Jerusalem. 
where we know that he will be executed for challenging the status quo of the religious establishment. Perhaps that's why he challenges those following him to decide whether they're willing to follow him to Jerusalem, which means ultimately to the cross. In our scripture, Jesus said, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This command of Jesus is shocking to us, at least on the surface. Does Jesus expect us to hate our families and to even hate our, our own lives? Two things I think are helpful here. First of all, Jesus is using hyperbole. And this was a frequent tool in his teaching. And those who were listening to him were aware that he was overstating his case. But secondly, Jesus' use of the word hate reflects a Hebrew idiom that is similar to one that we find in Genesis chapter 29. There we read that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, and the literal translation is that Leah was hated by Jacob. Most English translations soften the word hated and merely refer to Leah as unloved. Jesus here is not calling us to hate our families, or even to stop loving them. But instead, he's demanding our undivided loyalty. Jesus then says that discipleship is exemplified by a willingness to carry the cross. This phrase refers to giving up self-interest and any competing loyalties that prevent us from fulfilling our commitment to him. There is a high cost to following Jesus. It takes faithfulness and discipline. Jesus offers two examples of counting the cost. The first describes a landowner building a tower either for storing his crops or it might possibly have been a guard tower. The scripture says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. If we fail to tally the cost up front of what it's going to take to build, then we may run out of money and have to abandon the project midstream. His second example is about a king who's going to battle. But this king senses that the odds are against him. Again, Jesus said, Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks, for the terms of peace. If the king's army can't win, he needs to negotiate long before they ever meet on the battlefield. These stories illustrate the necessity of counting the cost of discipleship. Jesus then concludes with, So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your competing loyalties. Jesus calls us to the life of discipleship, and that life is not a cheap or easy one, nor can we enter into it without deep consideration of the consequences and the costs. The life of discipleship is a challenging one that requires us to let go of old, behavior, old behaviors and habits because these leave us with a less than abundant life but then we must take on new commitments and practices to help us live faithfully as followers of Jesus Christ. Following Jesus in a life of discipleship does not happen by accident. It happens by intention. So how can we de 
develop some habits for spiritual formation that will help us in the life of discipleship. Again, Duhigg, in his book, The Power of Habit, wrote that when a habit is formed, the brain stops fully participating in decision-making. The patterns we have unfold automatically. Our habitual behaviors are embedded in the deepest part of our brain, in the basal ganglia. Habits, though, save us mental energy so we can focus on other things. For instance, we get in the car, and before we know it, we're at home, and we haven't thought about any of the turns that we needed to make along the way. It's just an unconscious habit that we live into. Instead, we've been thinking about a sticky work problem or a project that awaits us at home. Habits allow us to use our brains to work on other things. Now, while this can be useful, there are also some downsides to this. First, if we're acting out of a bad habit, like an addiction or some other harmful pattern of thought, we don't have the consciousness to fight back because, remember, our responses are automatic. We may sense that that something is unhealthy or wrong, yet our brain gets shut out when we're on autopilot, and so we have no real defense against it. The second downside of mindless habits is that our unconscious choices form us just as much, if not more, than our conscious choices. We become formed in patterns that we would never consciously choose if we were aware of them. Thomas Aquinas, in his work, Summa Theology, taught that habit derives the word habit derives from the Latin habitus and its very, uh, variant stem, habier, which means to have. Therefore, it's possible for us to have a habit, but while it's equally as possible that a habit could have us. Justin Whitmill Early in his book Common Rule says that we can think of habits as liturgies. And remember, liturgies, that's what we use in worship. Liturgy is the worshipful work of the people and represents the elements of a worship service such as prayers, hymns, creeds, scripture readings, and the sacraments. Liturgies form the basis for establishing our relationship with God and with others who participate with us in the liturgies of worship. Liturgies and habits are both repeated over and over again, and they form us. The only difference is that a liturgy acknowledges that it's an act of worship. It's a conscious choice we make to develop ourselves in the image of God. When we gather together in worship, we're making a conscious choice to engage in these liturgical practices that shape and form us. Like liturgies, our habits have the power to shape our lives. What we do out of habit matters because our habits shape our identity. Our habits shape who we are. James K.A. Smith in his book, You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit, argues that the habits of our day-to-day lives are not secondary to our worship of God. Rather, they're central to it. Worship is formation, Smith says, and formation is worship. What we do shapes who we are. It forms us. And so we need to be careful about our habits. In Psalm 31.6, the psalmist declares our empty routines, our empty habits as worthless. He says, I hate those who make a habit of what is completely worthless. I myself make a habit of seeking the Lord. We become our habits. When we understand that our habits shape our lives and we understand the neurological process where our unconscious begins to take over as we as we form habits, then we begin to get an understanding of how our habits also shape our hearts, our affections, what we love, 
what we value. So how do we set an intention for spiritually forming ourselves as disciples of Christ? Monastic communities live by a specific daily order known as a rule. For instance, the rule of St. Benedict, which was written in 516 CE by Benedict of Nursia, guides Benedictine monks, monks all around the world through their daily routines. A rule is a set of habits you commit to engaging in in order to grow in your love of God and neighbor. Through these spiritual practices, we establish rhythms of faithfulness and devotion that lead to transformation, that shape us in the image of God in which we were created. Over the past two weeks, we've been practicing Lectio Divina, that is the reflective reading of Scripture. Some of you have faithfully engaged in the practice, and hopefully you've gained some insights into your relationship with God that have been powerful and that have begun to help shape who you are. If so, that's awesome. But I'm also aware that there are probably some of you that you find the practice of Lexio Divina frustrating. Uh, You may have a hard time focusing in order to be able to do it. Before you write off developing holy habits altogether, let's consider that maybe your struggle has more to do with incorporating a new pattern, a new routine, a new habit in your life than it did with Lexio Divina. So let's try again, but this time let's try with another spiritual practice. For the next two weeks, I want to encourage you to use Visio Divina. Visio Divina is a form of divine seeing in which we prayerfully invite God to indwell in us as we look at an image. Whereas Lexio Divina is reading a passage of Scripture and meditating on what we hear, Visio Divina is where we gaze at an image, allowing what we see to reveal God's truth to us. Visio Divina can touch places in our hearts where words cannot go, allowing God's Spirit to communicate with us at a level beyond words. So, how do we develop a practice of Visio Divina? I want to use the first law of behavior from James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, which is make it obvious. So, let's approach Visio Divina with a series of intentions. And the first intention is this, I will practice Visio Divina at a specific time in a specific location. And you determine that time and that location. The two most common cues in triggering automatic behavior are time and location. So we can make an implementation intention by connecting the new behavior with a a specific time and a specific place. For example, my intention could be, I will practice Visio Divina at 6.30 every morning while sitting on the couch. All right, intention number two. After I engage in a current habit, one that I already engage in, I will practice Visio Divina. This is an example of what Clear calls habit stacking, where we pair a new habit with an old habit. If we already wake up at 6.30 in the morning and drink a cup of coffee, then we would stack Visio Divina onto that current habit by letting drinking coffee be the cue that it's time to start Visio Divina. So then intention number three. I will establish a new environment and then position the image I'm using for Visio Divina conveniently in that place. If we're used to waking up at 6.30 in the morning and sitting at the table to drink coffee, and as we do, looking at our phone, we'll likely default to that behavior unless we alter the routine. Selecting a new environment instead of sitting at the table drinking coffee, sit on the couch, 
creates a new cue to practice Visio Divina. Going one step further and then adding another cue in the environment, like leaving the image that we're going to study, that we're going to gaze upon, there near the couch on the coffee table so that when we get our coffee, go to the couch, that image is right there, then we're more likely to engage in the Visio Divina. Then intention number four. I will make the cues that lead to my old habit invisible to help me resist my old behavior. When trying to stop a bad habit, it's easier to avoid temptation than it is to resist it. If we want to develop the practice of Visio Divina, but we usually look at our phone first thing in the morning, then we can reduce the trigger by leaving our phone on the charger until after we've done our Visio Divina. Now, here's a specific way to practice. First of all, set aside 5 to 20 minutes. Uh, when you begin, it may, 5 minutes may be all you can do. That's fine. Whatever you can do is fine. But create a sacred space. Settle into a comfortable posture. Since we're doing Visio Divina, be sure you have enough light to be able to see the image clearly. Take several slow breaths with deep inhales and exhales. You may choose to read Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 31 as part of entering into the sacred space because the image that we're going to provide this week is an image of lilies in a field. Then meditate on the image, gaze at the image, observe the details, ask questions, and ask God to help you see what He wants you to see. What stirs within you? What what is moving about what you see? And then pray to God. Share your thoughts about the image, asking God questions and focusing intently with your eyes to see if the Holy Spirit directs you to certain areas or aspects of the image and offers new insights into what you're seeing. And then contemplate the message. Contemplate what it is that God is revealing to you that is specifically for you at this particular time and season in your life. A contemplative spiritual exercise leads us to gospel action and a deeper connection with God. And then finally, thank God for meeting you in these moments. Thank God for interacting with you. Thank God for revealing Himself to you through this image. Jot down any thoughts or questions that you may want to return to during the day or in the coming week. Now, in the sermon outline, I've listed several other questions that may be helpful as you engage in this practice of Visio Divina. But I want you to remember this more than anything else. Visio Divina provokes honest thoughts, questions, and hopeful conversation with God. It provides a place where we can speak, but it also provides a place where we can be silent where we don't need words to communicate. Most of all, be aware that through this entire experience that God is trying to demonstrate His love for you. I look forward to hearing some of your stories about your engagement with Visio Divina and see if these intentions help you develop that practice. And we'll do this for a couple of weeks and then... uh, Uh, For the last two weeks of our series, we'll have a new practice that we'll be working on as well. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Oh God, we give thanks to you for your interest in our lives and your desire that we have life that is abundant. Help us to understand that like anything, that unless we invest ourselves in our relationship with you, we're likely not to get very much out of it. And so, as we take on these spiritual practices, empower us to draw close to You and to experience the abundant life that Jesus came to give. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.